Okay, we stopped last time in the middle of a paragraph. It was a difficult paragraph, and I would like to reread from the beginning of the paragraph and maybe um, remind you of some of the key points and then continue from where we left off. Okay, hold on. Okay, I'm beginning on page 20 in the second paragraph, second half of the page. I will read fluently and quickly, and then when we get to the part that I would like to explain, I will stop, and when we get to the part where we ended, we will start going sentence by sentence. So for now, I will read the whole first portion of the paragraph. What we have to get essential recognition for is that major creative writers are concerned with a necessary kind of thought. To such recognition, the climate of our age is hostile. Excuse me, by the way, I want to tell you, if there is any word in here that you don't understand or any concept or idea, please send your questions and we will answer them in real time here. So if I missed something last week that has bothered you, feel free to email us now or chat room. Okay, so to such recognition, the climate of our age is hostile. The hostility being a measure of the importance that is denied. Where the hostility prevails, thought is disabled for the performance of an indispensable function, the central one. The slighted truths are implicit in my insistence that English should represent and be recognized to represent a discipline sui generis, a discipline of intelligence. There will be no neat and final account of the distinctive discipline, but the need and the challenge to define and redefine will always be there. For the problems, decidedly in the plural here, that present themselves in so formidable a way and so inexorably as practical ones, involve tentativeness, incompleteness, and compromise so inescapably that the ends, the living principle, that together with the anung, someone told me how to say that over the questions, together with the anung implicit in them, should give the defects their meaning, will be lost if practice is not associated with thought that renews and reformulates. Let me recap a summary. Major creative writers are concerned with a certain kind of thought. Concerned with. In this context, concerned with means associated with, um, connected to, okay? Major creative writers are connected to a certain kind of thought. The climate of the age is hostile to the idea 
that major creative writers are important at all. The age would like to believe that literature is not important. Where the idea that says literature is not important prevails, thought itself becomes disabled for its most essential and central function. Essential means it we cannot do without it as a human race, and central means it is at the heart, at the center of what it means to be human. Are we a herd of buffalo? Are we animals that go in packs? Are we a hill of ants that live in community? Or are we human beings in the image of God forming divine communities? If we disable our most essential thought, then we lower ourselves toward the level of animals living in a herd. Maybe there's a question here. Question. <clears throat> One student asks, why does uh, Lewis use concerned instead of worried or upset? Cons All right, the so, question is, why does Levis use the word concerned instead of worried or upset? The reason I brought this word out is that it has several different meanings. One meaning is worry, anxiety, fear, nervousness. That is one meaning of concerned, but that is not the meaning that he wants to use here. In this context, concerned only means associated with, associated. The creative writers, the major creative writers, are not worried about the necessary kind of thought. The major creative writers are thinking in that way. The currency, the money, the tools, the product, everything the major creative writers are all about has to do with, has to do with this kind of thought. This kind of thought is the medium they work in, the medium. Just like an artist, uses paint, major creative writers use and function in the world of a kind of thought, which is the deepest, most central, essential, humanizing, lofty, subtle kind of thought that human beings are capable of. Now, the climate of our age disagrees. They would say scientists are concerned with the most important. I'm going to say, I'm going to write it for you. Science, scientists scientists are concerned with the most, a 
advanced and important thought. Okay. The world says scientists are concerned with the most important thought. But Levis says no way. Creative writers are concerned with the most advanced and important kind of thought because creative writers deal with life, all aspects of human life, our thoughts, our feelings, our experiences, our spiritual aspirations, our moral degradation. Everything is in creative, great creative literature. And the scientists only need a small amount of the language and vocabulary to express their concepts that a creative writer must have to express the breadth of concepts they are concerned with in every paragraph. Okay, so in this case, concern does not mean worry. It means it means they trade in these ideas. Okay? Another question. Another question. About the very first sentence in this paragraph. Mm -hmm. um, does the word necessary in the beginning of the paragraph we've just started uh, mean necessary for people's intelligence? Um, the question is, does the word necessary in the first sentence mean necessary for a person's intelligence? Was that it, Alessandro? Yes. Necessary for a person's intelligence. Or people's intelligence. People's intelligence. I don't read it that way myself, but maybe. It's possible. Let me tell you how I read it, and also let me tell you how what you say could be also true. Um, the word is necessary. For what? Okay, the way I read it is cre major creative writers are concerned with a necessary kind of thought. I think it is necessary to humanity. I think it is necessary to people collectively. It is not necessary that every person engage in lofty, creative, philosophical thought. That is not necessary. But it is necessary that in the whole group of humanity, somebody is engaging in this thought and writing and interacting. If the culture has no philosophers, no writers, no great thinkers, then the whole culture will sink down. So it is necessary to humanity that somebody be engaging in the highest level of thought. Now, it is also possible that it could be necessary to an individual if an individual wants to be highly educated 
and wants to be intelligent and wants to be an expert in any field, scientific, political, theological, economic, any field, it is necessary that he is capable of engaging in this kind of high level thought. So I think it is possible that Levis believes this kind of intelligence to be necessary to an individual. But I personally thought he meant necessary for humanity or for the culture at large. It's my opinion. Okay, so where are we? Okay, so we're talking about how the, um, the culture does not believe that creative writers are the tradesmen in a necessary, essential kind of thought. They prefer to believe that scientists are at the top. And in places where the hostility toward intelligence prevails, people become stupid. They become cretinized. They become like animals. Their thought is disabled for the necessary central function, which is to elevate them to the level of humanity from the level of animal um, instinct. Okay. Slide of truth from He then says English should be seen as a discipline that is in a category by itself, a foundational discipline, um, not just the learning of grammar so that we can understand a complex sentence, but also broad reading and exposure to literature the literature of many ages from early times through the centuries to the present day. Because as you read and study and criticize and compare and make connections, you develop a high level of thinking so English, this high level of thinking will enable you to succeed in science or mathematics or anything else. The English is foundational. It is the first thing. And upon it, you build other disciplines. So it is a discipline in its own category, like learning your first language, like learning to read. You must learn your first language before you can learn anything else. And you must learn to read before you can study anything else. So the study of English, as he puts it, by which he means broad knowledge of a rich literary tradition is a discipline in and of itself set apart foundational, like speech and reading, and maybe writing. Okay, uh, let's see. He goes on to say that it is hard to define, difficult to define how we will teach this, how we will train, what the distinctive discipline will look like, but we will constantly, as educators, be redefining our goals. And here he comes to a phrase that is very important. The living principle. Okay, I'm going to reread the last sentence that we studied last week. It begins with the words, let me find it one moment. It's a very hard sentence, by the way. 
Okay, it begins with the words for the problems, decidedly in the plural. Okay, I'm going to reread that sentence because this is our last sentence before we begin our new section. For the problems, decidedly in the plural here, that present themselves in so formidable a way and so inexorably as practical ones, involve tentativeness, incompleteness, and compromise. So inescapably that the ends the living principle that, together with the anung implicit in them, should give the defects their meaning, will be lost if practice is not associated with thought that renews and reformulates. Okay, before I go to the heart of this sentence, I want to point out certain words which are giving a feeling to the sentence. The words are formidable, formidable. Okay. Inexorably. inescapably okay these three words all speak of disaster formidable Generally speaking, the words have a feeling of disaster. Disaster, I'll give you that word too. A disaster is something so terrible that the sky is falling. It is the end of the world. A disaster is a horrible calamity. These words suggest the coming of a disaster. They give a feeling of fear and anxiety to the sentence. Now, in the context, um, they don't actually refer to terrible things. Um, in the case of formidable, he is talking about the problems that are presenting themselves in a formidable way. So he's talking about the problems as being formidable. Formidable means big, big problems. Now, the problems he was talking about, I thought were more pedagogical problems, how to teach, how to um, accomplish, our goal of nurturing intelligence in students. This um, type of problem, you would not usually use a word like formidable to describe. Maybe um, if the problems were really terrible, the school-based problems. For example, in America, the problem of violence in the schools is formidable. It is hard to uh, uh, hard to overcome, hard to address, but um, the problems here of how to foster intelligence through literary study would not seem to me to be formidable. However, he uses the word formidable. Then he says, um, in 
inexorably as practical ones. So he says the problems present themselves in a formidable way, inexorably as practical ones. Inexorable means a fate that you cannot escape. It sort of means, it's very like inescapable. It means ruthless. It means without pity. It will come and you cannot escape it. You do not normally use inexorable to describe something as practical. He is saying the problems are practical. We have practical problems. How will we write a curriculum? How will we get it paid for? How will we train teachers? How will we adjust our program so that it will meet the needs of the students? We have practical problems. But somehow he has worked in the words formidable and inexorable in the simple sentence, the problems are practical. Why is he doing this? He also goes on to say inescapably. Let's see what that's about. Okay, the practical problems involve tentativeness, incompleteness, and compromise so inescapably. Again, this word is a little bit too strong. If you're saying we have a practical problem, our approach is too tentative. We wouldn't say we cannot escape the problem of tentativeness. To an English person, that would sound funny. Um, he's using a strong word for a small problem. Well, we have to compromise. We cannot escape. We cannot escape from our need to compromise. I think we need to understand from his choice of words that he is not just writing a book about teaching um, principles. He's not writing a book for teachers of English, um, English teachers who will work in the school system. He is not just writing a book um, for pedagogical reasons. He is writing a deeper theological, um, I don't think the word is theological. Uh, he's writing a different, um, more of a philosophical work. He is talking about a problem in the society and in the world and in humanity. And so he is ramping up the emotional content of what could be a very simple um, problem of how to teach a class. Okay, so formidable means a problem that is very daunting, very scary, probably too big to overcome. Inexorable speaks of the approach of something bad. And inescapable means you can't get away from it. It's like a picture of a wave, a tsunami, a tsunami that is coming. And it will engulf your town and kill your family for sure. These are the images that you can get from these words. Okay, let's see what else in this sentence. Okay, the problems decidedly in the plural means there's lots of problems that present themselves in so formidable a way and so inexorably as practical ones involve tentativeness, incompleteness and compromise so inescapably that the ends, the living principle. I'm going to write that down. This is very important.
That the ends, the living principle, together with the anung implicit in them, uh, should give the defects their meaning, will be lost if practice is not associated with thought, which renews and reformulates. Ends. When you think of the word end, what do you think of? End. We think of beginning and ending. In time, the beginning is creation. The end is the return of Christ, maybe. Our birth is our beginning. Our end is our death. So the end of a book, the end of a movie. That is not the kind of end he is using here. He is using the word end to mean goal or destination. Goal, destination, It is what we are shooting for, what we are trying to accomplish. It is the place we are going, the ends that we are trying to accomplish, that which we are working for, the living principle. So he equates the ends with the living principle. Okay. Um, so the ends will be lost if practice is not associated with thought that renews and reformulates, together with the anung implicit in them. Okay, uh, the, uh, let us begin with the next sentence that we haven't read yet from last week, beginning with the words, by slipping. By slipping in after ends, that brief parenthetic phrase, I meant to intimate that what one for this, for that, or for the other directing purpose necessarily emphasizes an end in view gets its full significance from a totality of apprehension and concern and that the complex totality is a vital unity. This is a very complex sentence. And the first time I read it, I did not understand anything of it. Not one word, <laughs> it seems. But let's look at several words before we take the whole sentence. First, the question of slipping in. Okay. Um, the word slip, slip means to insert inconspicuously. Now it does mean, it can mean to fall down, like I slipped on a banana peel and fell to the ground. It can mean to slip on something slippery like ice and fall down. But it can also mean to put something in, in an inconspicuous way so nobody notices. I slipped him a tip, a dollar. I slipped him a note. Slip means to give it to him in a way that no one will see. Okay, so Levis slipped in the parenthetic phrase, the living principle. He slipped it in after the word, the ends. He slipped it in inconspicuously, but it was an important phrase. Okay. What does it mean to intimate something? Intimate. This is a word, if you look it up in the dictionary, you might not get the right definition. First of all, intimate, there's a difference pronunciation. Intimate is a different word. Intimate is an adjective meaning close, um, close relationship. That's intimate. This word is a verb. It's intimate. It is pronounced with a long A. 
intimate. It's a verb. And it means to imply. To imply is to give information without saying it directly. To tell something in a roundabout way is to intimate, to give an idea indirectly. So he intimate, he meant to intimate something, it means he meant to imply something. Okay, he didn't want to say it directly. He wanted to slip it in for some reason. Go this. Is that better? Okay. All right. Let's see. Okay. Now he has a, a rather long phrase that says that what one for this, for that, or for the other directing purpose. For this, for that, or for the other directing purpose. Um, this is an example of Levis uses a lot of words to say something that could be said in a much shorter way. Sometimes we say, well, for this or that or the other thing, for this, for that, or for the other thing, it just means for some reason, okay? So he is saying for some reason, for some purpose, when he says for this, for that, or for the other. It just means some reason, okay? All right, let's see. Necessarily, okay, totality of apprehension and concern. Let us get that in the midst of the sentence. Okay, let us look at the whole sentence again. By slipping in after ends, that brief parenthetic phrase. So it was ends, the living principle. By slipping in that brief parenthetic phrase after the word ends, I meant to intimate. I meant to imply. By slipping it in, I was trying to tell you that what one emphasizes. Okay, you've got to uh, take out some phrases to understand this sentence. It should be this. By slipping in after the word ends, this brief parenthetic phrase, I meant to imply, or I meant to intimate, that Um, I wrote this down earlier. Give me a second to find it. That what one emphasizes as an end gets its significance from a totality of apprehension and concern. So, I meant to imply that the end meaning this one, gets its significance from a totality of apprehension and concern. Gets its significance probably means something like is defined, okay? Is described and defined by, but I'll write gets its significance. The end gets its significance the 
this means gets its meaning. This means is defined by a totality of apprehension and concern. Okay, apprehension comes from the root to apprehend. Apprehend. To apprehend means to catch. We say that a policeman apprehended the criminal. We also apprehend an idea when we get the concept. If we chase something and catch it, we have apprehended it. So, apprehension is that which we can conceive of, that which we know, that which we can perceive. A totality of apprehension means everything we can conceive of or experience through our senses what we get through our senses, and what we deduce from our mind. The totality means all of it. Totality of everything we apprehend through our senses and intellectually. And concern. Concern here has a different meaning than concern earlier. Here, concern means basically what we value, what we value. What is important? So totality refers to apprehension and concern. So it means everything we value and everything which is important. So, this sentence at its core, with none of the extras, which we'll look at in a second, at its core it means, I meant by inserting this phrase, the living principle, to imply that the end in view gets its significance or is defined by everything we can know and everything we value. The living principle is an extremely broad concept. He will go on to make it broader still than just this. Okay, let us look at the sentence again. By slipping in after ends that brief parenthetic phrase, I meant to intimate that what one for this, for that, or for the other directing purpose necessarily emphasizes as an end in view. Okay, that whole phrase, what one for this, for that, or for the other directing purpose necessarily emphasizes as an end in view, all of that simply means the end. <laughs> He's saying, I meant to intimate that what somebody might call the end, for some reason, what someone might identify as our ultimate goal, gets its significance from a totality of apprehension and concern. In other words, what one might think of as the end is defined by an extremely broad category of things. Okay? All right. Comma. And, see the sentence isn't even over yet. Okay. It gets its full significance. Not just significance, it's full significance. 
Here we have Levis again using words to try to round out and ramp up the impact of what he's saying. Full significance um, from a totality of apprehension and concern, comma, and that the complex totality is a vital unity. Okay, we got to look at every word of that. The complex totality. Totality is a vital unity. Okay, the complex totality. Complex means many parts. And when he is talking about the totality of everything we apprehend and are concerned with, obviously that's very complex. Many layers, many levels, everything we see with our senses, everything we feel with our hearts. The ends in view have to do with many things. They interact with each other. They are complex. Totality refers to it all as one thing. It is complex, but it is a totality. Just like the planet Earth is complex, but it is a totality. Many systems, ocean, land, desert, um, mountains, uh, uh, forests, etc., but one totality. So, a complex totality is a vital unity. The word vital has to do with vitality. It means alive. Alive. The living principle. Somehow what he is talking about these ends, not only is it just the vast totality of all we apprehend and all we are concerned with or all we value, not only that, it is also alive. God created Adam from clay and made him a full body. But then he breathed life and made him a living soul. So Levis is saying, we are dealing not only with thoughts, impressions, um, it's concepts, but there is something alive that we are dealing with, some kind of organism. Perhaps not a literal organism, perhaps figurative or analogous, but he is making the case that something about the ends we have in view, our hope and what we deal with, what we are concerned with, is more than just the ideas that make us human. It is something alive and vital, and it is a unity. This word connects to this word. Unity and totality, it's all one. It is a thing which is complex, alive, and unified. It is the living principle. That is the title of the book, and it is something he is trying to construct for us. It is not something obvious and easy, like this eraser or this pen. You cannot look at the living principle and say, there it is. The way you can look at a tree or a house or a planet. You cannot look at it. But nonetheless, Levis is trying to make the case that this exists somehow out there. Okay, so we'll read the last sentence and then move on. By slipping in after ends, that brief parenthetic phrase, I meant to intimate that what one for this, for that, or the other directing purpose necessarily emphasizes as an end in view, gets its full significance 
from a totality of apprehension and concern, and that the complex totality is a vital unity. It seems to me important to think of this kind of unity as hardly distinguishable from the principle that makes it one, principle here implying an energy that, representing a nisus that has maintained a creative continuity from human beginnings and goes back to the source, impels, directs, and controls. Okay, first off, he says, it seems to me important. When I was studying this book with Olavo, he said, this sentence is key. And I broke it off in brackets to show that this sentence is key. And Levis says, it seems to me important, which he hasn't even said before. He is now directly saying this is important. Okay. What is important? It is important to think of this kind of unity as hardly distinguishable from the principle that makes it one. Okay, so we're talking about a unity, a vital unity, a living unity. Unity can mean one thing. Or it can imply many things functioning for one purpose. My understanding of this unity that he is speaking of is that there is an unbroken literary tradition that goes back to the beginning of humanity. In the beginning of humanity and through the ages, creative men and women have written their ideas down. And the next person takes up their idea and goes further. And the next person relying upon the first and the second, takes those ideas and goes further. And the next person, relying on the first, second, and third, takes their ideas, adds to it creatively, and goes further. And what results is an unbroken, unified chain of wisdom and thought that has defined the progress of humanity from the beginning until now. Each person reflecting upon what has gone before, each person adds something to take the next step for humanity. It is a procession of living minds, each putting forth their own contribution, their own cell, their own addition to an ever-growing organism. It is like a tree which begins slender and small, but every year another la layer is added and, and the tree grows up and out until after a long time, hundreds of years, you have an enormous tree. All of it is alive and it is huge and strong and high. And if you take a cross section and look, you will see each ring building upon the last into a mammoth huge organism, which is one tree and which is alive. This is how I think Levis is picturing the growth of humanity intellectually and spiritually. And um, I think Levis is afraid that if we disable this kind of thought, 
in the present generation, we will lose the tree. With scientific knowledge, if one generation forgets, it is possible for a new generation to rediscover the truth that has been forgotten. If we forget how to make a light bulb, maybe in a hundred years, another Thomas Edison will be born who will reinvent the light bulb. However, if we lose literary knowledge and wisdom, it will never come back. If someone cuts down the tree and burns the stump, it is lost forever. No one will ever again write um, the Odyssey by Homer. No one will ever again write um, Plato's Republic. No one will ever again write Moby Dick. These literary masterpieces will be lost if they are forgotten in one generation. Or if the generation, for example, if they were to burn the books or something, but if the generation becomes unable to recognize the value, then they won't even save the classic literature. In our day, I'll leave us, we'll go on to talk about this, and I think maybe he spoke of it in the introduction. Um, the excellent literature which is written in our day is not even recognized. The literature which is put out as modern literature for students to read is not excellent because people no longer are recognizing where excellence lies. So I think this is what he is talking about here. So let us reread the sentence we're looking at again. It seems to me important to think of this kind of unity. So picture the tree, the kind of unity of a living substance as hardly distinguishable from the principle which makes it one. Principle here implying an energy that now we have a parenthetic phrase uh, set off in commas representing a nisus that has maintained a creative continuity from human beginnings and goes back to the source. I believe the word nisus means an energy or an effort. OK, so an effort which has maintained creative continuity. Continuity means one building on the next in an unbroken chain. This is continuity, never a break, each one resting on the last. OK, so we have an effort which has maintained a creative continuity from the beginning, uh, a creative continuity from human beginnings and goes back to the source, the source being the heart of mankind, the heart of our intelligence made in the image of God. OK, so he is speaking of an effort which has maintained this continuity from the beginning. So let us put that aside and reconnect the um, center of the sentence, the core of the sentence. It should say, it seems to me important to think of this kind of unity as hardly distinguishable from the principle that makes it one. Principle here implying an energy that directs, impels, directs, and controls. So energy that directs, impels, and controls. Okay, principle implies an energy. I'm going to write that down. So the unity is hardly distinguishable from the principle, which implies an energy which um, I was getting it wrong before. Impels, directs, and controls. Impels, 
direct and controls. My experience of Levis is that he is never redundant. Redundant. Redundant means repetitious, repeating the same thing in different words. In English, we like to have threes. If I do not have three things to say, I will say the same thing three times just to get three. I will be redundant. Okay? Sometimes an author will say three words like impels, directs, and controls, and they all mean the same thing. But that is not Levis. Usually when he says more than one thing, they mean something different. So we want to look at each word. The energy which impels. Now remember, we are thinking of the energy which causes this tree to live and grow. The tree being the literary knowledge, the wisdom and thought of mankind from the beginning. Where is the energy which causes this to continue and maintain itself and grow? The energy which impels. To impel is to push and to use force to make an object go forward. Um, if you have fuel in a rocket ship and it explodes, the force will impel the rocket up through the atmosphere. It is a strong word for propelling things forward. So the energy which impels is that which is making it happen. Directs means this is not just some explosion like evolution, which is suggesting a big bang where you have energy which impels things outward in all directions. No, this is directed. This is in a certain direction. The tree doesn't grow in all directions. It grows only toward the sun. It grows only up. So it is a directed movement and controls. Um, it is not an uncontrolled growth like a cancer. This is a systematic orderly growth. When you imagine each person relying upon the former and building the case for wisdom and knowledge that humanity has cumulatively. It is a controlled force. So he is talking about the living principle and it is the unity, the creative continuity is hardly distinguishable from the energy or the principle which impels, directs, and controls. Okay, so the living principle is not only a goal, it is a force which we all as students, you and I, at least not everybody in society, but you and I, we would like to be in on this. We would like to join in to this uh, this river, this current, this riptide, this flow of wisdom and intelligence and growth that is um, energized by this living principle. End of paragraph. Um, shall we go on to the next paragraph? Yeah, okay. <clears throat> the word is both a reminder and a mandate. The word he is referring to is principle. Um, the living principle, which refers to this energy. It is a reminder 
and a mandate. By reminder, he means something which calls us back. It is possible for us to forget that we are not just living for the day, that we have a direction, that we are supposed to be growing in a certain way. We are supposed to be making an impact. So the principle, the living principle, reminds us of our high calling. It is also a mandate. A mandate is an order. Um, it is something you are told to do authoritar authoritatively. Um, an officer gives a command to his soldier and the soldier must do it. It is a mandate, not a suggestion. So the living principle is a strong call to you and me to do something about our day and age, to join and to grow with the tree, the group. In this use then, it doesn't imply the abstract or merely theoretic. Okay, so when it says in this use, the way we are using this word principle, we are calling it a mandate, we are not just talking theoretically. We do not want you to simply sit in your chair and say, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. We do not want you to entertain your mind. Oh yes, I agree. We want you to do something active. It is not only abstract. Do you agree or disagree? It is not merely theoretic. Okay. The thought in question for us, vindicators of English, is, as I have said, antithetically remote from mathematics. It involves a consciousness of one's full human responsibility, purpose, and the whole range of human valuation. Okay, start from the beginning here. The thought in question for us, vindicators of English. Okay, the thought in question is still the living principle, the existence of this creative continuity that went from the beginning and continues till now. That's the thought for us. Vindicators of English. Now, when it sets off in um, commas, it is referring to us. We are vindicators of English. Vindicators means we defend it and we say English is being neglected. And by English, he doesn't mean only English. He means the study of a rich and subtle literary tradition, literary language, okay? The mastery of literary language and of literature itself, okay? He calls it English because that's him. But for you and me, he doesn't mean just English. He means the rich literary tradition and mastering it, okay? Um, we are the vindicators of it because we are the ones who are saying, no, this is important and you must not get rid of it. You must not neglect it in a whole generation. We stand up for English and for the study of literature, okay? We know it is key and crucial and essential. We are the vindicators of English. Vindicator. Yes. As opposed to revenge, a uh, vindicator versus an avenger. Right. Um, the question is, what is the difference between to vindicate versus to get revenge or avenge? Vindicating has nothing to do with revenge. Or um, to vindicate is a positive thing. Revenge is a negative thing. If a person is accused of a crime and everybody believes he did it and everybody looks down on him and refuses to associate with him and thinks him to be a dog, thinks him to be low, despises him. And then somebody else comes 
and reveals new information that shows that this guy did not do it. Maybe the judge did it, or maybe the uh, other person did it, who is the real bad guy. This person is now lifted up. He is vindicated. His character is restored. And now everybody applauds him and apologizes to him and respects him and believes in him. He has been vindicated. It has nothing to do with getting revenge on the guy who lied about him. It's only the person who came forth to bring forth the good information which cleared up the lies and the misunderstanding. That person has vindicated. Okay? So if we are vindicating English, we are taking English away from its low position. Somehow people have the idea that it's not important to study literature. It's just like art and music and um, it's okay, we shouldn't discourage it, but it's not as important as science or mathematics. That's what people think now. So they disrespect English, but we are lifting it back up and saying, no, it is vital, it is necessary, it is essential, it is the foundation of all learning. When we say that, we are vindicating English. That's what we're trying to do anyway. Maybe no one believes us. But anyway, that's what it means to vindicate. All right. So we, vindicators of English, okay, the thought in question for us is, as I have said, antithetically remote from mathematics. So the thought in question from us, for us is remote from mathematics. It is antithetically remote. Antithetically means opposites. So if, if two things are remote from each other and this is the globe, maybe they are that far apart. But if they're antithetical, they're infinitely removed. So antithetically remote means it has nothing to do with it at all. So the thought in question for us, the living principle, has absolutely nothing to do with mathematics or anything like ma mathematics. It's not like this is mathematics and then some. Mathematics has nothing to do with it. And by mathematics, read a simple, unambiguous train of thought. A logical if this, then that. That's mathematics. No ambiguity at all. Just pure step-by-step um, step, uh, demonstration of facts. Mathematics has no ambiguity. This type of thinking, this logical thinking that mathematics does, is not at all like the living principle. The living, it's as different as a tree is from a bar of steel. A bar of steel is dead and simple and perfectly straight. Whereas the tree is full of life and irregularity and um, has living uh, processes going on at all times. Okay, so the thought in question for us, which is the living principle, is antithetically remote from mathematics. It involves a consciousness of one's full human responsibility, purpose, and the whole range of human valuation. This is a repeat of the sentence we had before when it says it's the totality of apprehension and concern. Okay, he's, he's making his point as strongly as possible that the thought we are talking about involves the totality of our humanity. If we lose this, we become like the animals we lose our humanity. We lose something essential to our, um, to our spiritual life, okay? It involves a consciousness of one's full human responsibility. Consciousness means 
You have it at the front of your mind. You are aware. How many people do you know in your town or at your place of work who are not aware of their full human responsibility? I think many people are living lives that are not aware. Aware in a broad sense. They simply wake up, they eat, they go to work, they come home, they watch television, they go to sleep. This is not um, a life which is aware and conscious of our full human responsibility. Responsibility, purpose, and the whole range of human valuation. So let us think about those words here. Responsibility, purpose, and the whole range of human valuation. So we have full human responsibility, purpose, and the whole range of valuation. Okay, I put full human on top and the rest indented because full human goes with all three. It modifies responsibility, purpose, and whole range. So this aspect of humanity is implicit in each of these, not just full human responsibility, I believe. Okay, so I wrote these up because I want to talk about the meaning, but also because I want to ask you to think. Are we part of the tree? Are we, you and I, functioning within the living principle? Are we conscious of our full human responsibility? I bet we're not. If I had time, I might say, let us stop for five minutes and think and reflect and write down on a piece of paper what you think your full human responsibility is. Are you conscious of it? I think we will have homework this week. For homework, I invite you. It is not a mandate. It is a suggestion. Write what is your full human responsibility? Do you have the intelligence to think of this, to conceive of it? The question is, are you the kind of student who has been disabled for the central kind of thought by your education or lack of it? Have you read broadly in literature so that you have understood the kinds of traumas that human beings must face? Have you understood and had compassion for people in terrible situations through literature? Do you have a call on your life to relieve suffering or to lift up those who are low? What is your human responsibility? So for homework, I would invite you to write down your thoughts and send them in, and I'll write something too. I'll pray about it and I'll think about it. I might be too embarrassed to read you mine, but I'll read some of yours. So that's homework. But what do the words mean? Full human responsibility. Responsibility is what you must do because if you don't do it, it won't get done and nobody else is going to do it for you. It is your job and if you don't do it, other people will suffer. If you are a man, maybe it is your responsibility to bring money to your wife for food for the children. Maybe. Your responsibility is what you must do in honor. And your human 
responsibility might be something that you will do for mankind. Full human purpose. What is your purpose? If God did not make you, what would be the lack? What would be the vacuum? What would be the hole in the world that you fill? Who would miss you if you were gone? What is your purpose? And the whole range of human valuation everything that is truly important this is what the thought the living principle is concerned with for us so the sentence says the thought in question for us vindicators of english as we are is as i have said antithetically remote from mathematics but rather it involves how do they say it? A consciousness, conscious thought, direct conscious awareness of our full human responsibility, purpose, and the whole range of human valuation. Thought of that order, I'm reading now, if it is to matter in the world of practice, must, one might suppose, be collaborative and continuous in some relevant community. In the first place, the community of those responsible and practically engaged in a university English school. Okay, this sentence is very straightforward and clear. It says, thought of this order, all-encompassing thought, if it is to matter in the world, world of practice. In other words, if you're going to do more than sit in your chair and go, hmm, I disagree, or hmm, I agree. If you're going to actually go out and do something and make a difference in your world, this kind of thought must exist in a community. He says one might suppose, meaning he's thinking probably, it must exist in a community. It must be collaborative. Collaborative means um, you work with another person and another and another. You cooperate um, to bring about a, an end or a goal which is larger than what e any one of you can do by yourself. So, if you're going to do this, you also must be in a community where you can work together on a task which is larger than you. So it must be collaborative, working together, and continuous. That means you don't do it for today only. You continue. You continue for a long time, maybe a lifetime. And by continuous, it even suggests what we talked about before, continuous continuity. The words mean the same thing. It keeps going on one above the next. So collaborative and continuous in time. Margarita, yes. A question has just come up. Um, a student asks, what exactly does whole range of human valuations mean? The question is, what exactly does whole range of human valuations mean? <clears throat> okay. Um, it involves a consciousness of one's full human responsibility, purpose, and the whole range of human valuations. Okay. Um, I may value one thing. For example, I myself value children, and I myself value young people and teaching young people. But someone else might value the environment. 
so someone else may go out and try to clean up the water or the air pollution. Maybe they will work to pass laws to protect the environment. Someone else may be worried about the poor people in um, Ethiopia. So maybe they will go and work to feed poor people. And someone else may be interested in um, truth and in right thinking. And so maybe they will study and write books and teach lectures. So each human being has a different central value. But when you speak of the living principle, it encompasses the full range of the cumulative total, all of the values put together. It means everything that is valuable, everything which is good and perfect that some person will value. So the living principle involves a consciousness of all of the good that is in the world, that is created by God whether I personally value it highly or not. Okay, does that answer the question? And so I, 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 maybe you could um, just give a, a brief explanation about the word range. Maybe okay, the word range, um, it means an expanse. For example, if uh, somebody is extremely liberal, Maybe they are uh, in favor of communism. Someone else is extremely conservative. And maybe they're on a totally other end, and maybe they end up extremely right-wing, even fascist. And in between, there is a range. Okay, And at any point, you will have a group of values. And if you move over here, it will be slightly different. And over here, slightly different. The range is the expanse that covers everybody. So if you line up every person in the world in a line and ask them their values, this person values this, this person values this, and there's something in between. Everybody has something in between. This is the full range of human valuations. Okay, so that, does that answer it? Okay, so thought of this order, of that order, if it is to matter in the world of practice, must, one might suppose, be collaborative and continuous in some relevant community. Um, relevant means um, one that pertains to yourself that is not completely different. Um, what he is saying is, if you want to have an impact on the world, you must join with others who are like-minded, who, who have the same ideas as you. And you must be in a community with those people. In the first place, the community of those responsible and practically engaged in a university English school. So Levis is saying that the first thing to do is find a group of people who are students like you in what he calls a university English school, but he has already said they don't exist. The university English school he is speaking of is not the one that is in your town because almost all of the university English programs are um, debased. They're, they're not working properly. So he means, what he really means is a group of students who are studying with the greatest level of seriousness the literary richness of their tradition and heritage so that they themselves can grow and they can contribute meaningfully to the store of wisdom of the world. Okay? So, and to be practically engaged means to be um, actually doing something. And in any case, 
one needs hope and at least moral support. Okay, if you, when he says one needs, he just means a person, any person, every person. That's what it means when he says one. Needs hope. If you believe that there is no hope at all, that the world, excuse me, is going straight down, that everybody is disabled, that you are alone and you can make no difference, then you will not try. You will not even try. You need hope. Also, you need moral support. Moral support is a phrase. It has nothing to do with morality. Moral does not mean um, good behavior here. Moral support is one thing. And it means encouragement. Moral support is encouragement. I'll write the word down for you. Encouragement. Um, moral support is what happens when you have a friend who says, good job. When you have a friend who brings you a cup of coffee and says, I respect what you are doing. He is giving you moral support. He may not help you in a real way, but he is encouraging you. We need hope and we need moral support. That is why we must be in a community of people, a collaborative community where everybody is working together continuously, one that has continuity. It's not just here today and gone tomorrow, and one which is encouraging. So Levis is saying that if we are serious about putting this forth, we must be in a community that will encourage us. Okay, next paragraph. Okay, we're going to stop here. Five minute break. And if you have questions, please send them. Uh, questions of any sort in Portuguese or English. And we'll see you in five minutes. Okay, we have uh, a few questions. And if you would like, you can send more um, and we'll get them as you send them. The first question is about the use of the word anung. Um, the student asks, did Levis use the word anung in the phrase together with the anung implicit in them to avoid the repetition of the word meaning in that sentence? Anung in German means no keo, no so, no so. I can't speak Portuguese. It's notion. Notion. Oh, well, notion in English is idea. Uh, and it could be used as meaning in English. Do you agree? I don't think he means meaning. Um, Olavo and I researched the word when we studied this. And we came up with the idea that anung has an implication of um, foreboding or foreseeing in the future something worrisome or negative possibly coming. It's like a premonition. So I think it means um, it's on page 20. We're talking about the problems that present themselves in so formidable a way. Remember, formidable, inescapable, inexorable. Anung, apparently, is in that uh, type of word. It apparently is used to mean something bad coming. OK, uh, the ends that, together with the anung implicit in them, should give the defects their meaning. Hmm. Actually, I, w I might need to contradict this. It does mean foreknowledge. It means something that is coming. 
but I'm not sure it was the negative. I think maybe we thought it meant that and decided not. Because anung is connected with ends. The, um, the ends that we are going toward and all of the implications of those ends. So I would say the word is that I would use as a synonym is implications. Implication. So the ends and the implications contained in them. So if we achieve the ends, what will happen? Or if the ends arrive, what will happen? I think that is the meaning of anung in this context. At least, I was never very sure about that, but that's what I think. Okay. Um, let's see. This is a comment that was sent. The image used by Margarita reminded me of the following verses from Chesla Milos. Longing, not that I want to be a god or a hero, just to change into a tree, grow for ages, not hurt anyone. I think that's very beautiful. I'll reread it. Longing, not to be a god or a hero, just to change into a tree, to grow for ages and not hurt anyone. I also was thinking of a verse, the righteous man will be a tree planted by still waters and his fruit, his leaf will not wither and his fruit will come in season. And uh, one more. Do you know about other homeschooling experiences? Uh, could they offer helpful information for your educational project? I know about a lot of homeschooling experiences. I have been homeschooling for about 16 years and almost all of my friends homeschool and I am in groups of homeschoolers that have hundreds of members. And I have been to a convention every year for the past 15 years that has several thousand homeschoolers and also has seminars and um, activities to teach and train and share ideas. So yes, I know lots and lots about homeschooling. And also, yes, it helps my educational project. If what you mean is, um, do I bring homeschool approaches to my teaching? Yes, whenever I teach, I use homeschool methods. And these methods work very well. And the students who have never experienced such methods love my classes. They don't understand why they are learning now what they failed to learn before in school. So I'm very excited to bring homeschool methods into the world at large because it's like inventing the light bulb for a civilization that is very dark. Also, my daughter, who is 20 years old, is graduating this year from college as a psychologist. And she is working right now on a thesis, um, a paper in which she will bring homeschool ideas to the use um, of a residential facility for um, juvenile delinquents. I think I'm speaking in a, 
language that is too difficult. I'll make it more simple. My daughter is working in a home for teenagers who are in trouble. They have failed in school and they have gotten in trouble with the police. And so they have been taken away from their parents and put in a home. And people who are trained to work with them, live with them and work with them. And my daughter is working with them right now. And all she is doing is doing with them what we do in our home. And they are coming alive. And so my daughter has to write a thesis um, on some new concept in working with troubled children. And she is currently writing about the methods we use in the home school as though they are new ideas in working with troubled children. And she is uh, preparing a proposal to get money from the government to establish a, an experiment to bring these methods into secular um, treatment of troubled children. So I've heard many stories of adult homeschooled children, children who have been homeschooled and have grown up and gone out into the world and have used the methods of homeschooling in a secular um, humanistic con context and had marvelous results. So yes, I know a lot about that. Um, is that it? Okay, we're done for today and I'll see you next week. And if you have any thoughts or questions, um, please send them and also don't forget we have homework. Oh, sorry. oh wait, There's one moment. One more question. Uh, <clears throat> could you elaborate a little bit more on the homework you assigned? Right, homework. That's what I wanted to say. Okay, we, we read in Levis that a person who is part of the living principle, who has the kind of intelligence that Levis is looking for, this person will be conscious of his full human responsibility. So Levis used the term conscious. of his or her full human responsibility and purpose. I hope that you and I have the kind of intelligence that Levis is talking about. The kind of intelligence that is awake and aware of the important things in life, those things which are truly valuable. I hope we are consciously aware of our full human responsibility and our purpose. Why, why did God create you? Why did God create me? What is my purpose? I think it would be good for you and for me, for all of us, to think about this, to reflect, to pray, and to write. Let us write down what we believe our full human responsibility is and, or if you prefer, what your purpose is. You can do both or one or the other. Write these things and email them in 
and next week we will interact with what you have written. I will also do it. I will write what I believe my full human responsibility is. Not just mine, but abstractly. What is our full human responsibility? So I want you to write in English, preferably, and email it in, and we will go over what you say for content as well as for English writing. Is that clear? Okay, good luck. I look forward to seeing your writing. Till next time.